Let's talk about the true nature of some of these organizations. We have this story from TimCast.com. Black Lives Matter purchased $5.8 million mansion from friend who paid $3.1 million days earlier. Patrice Cullors described criticism of the purchase as racist and sexist in an Instagram post. <laughs> According to a New York Magazine report, the National Black Lives Matter group purchased a $6 million mansion in LA with donor funds in October 2020. BLM took measures to keep the purchase a secret. On Wednesday, Cullors responded to questions over the cash purchase of the Studio City Mansion, describing them as racist and sexist. She said that the author had a proven and very public bias against uh, me and other black leaders. The expansive estate was purchased by Diane Pascal, the financial manager for the LLC Janaya and Patrice Consulting. The New York Post reported the property was purchased from televangelists Sean and Sherry Boltz on October 21st, 2020 for $3.1 million. Quote, LA County property assessment records consulted by the post show the value of the two parcels combined. It's one, one house with two buildings at 3.3 million on July 6, 2020, three months before Pascal's purchase. The value nearly doubled after the purchase of the property on January 24th, 2021. The assessment for the two parcels shot up to 5.8. Pascal told the post he paid the asking price without elaborating further. Within, within a week of the purchase, ownership was transferred to an LLC in Delaware named after the property's address public records show. Now, I don't know exactly <laughs> if this proves anything definitively, but here's what it sounds like mm -hmm. at the very least. There were televangelists who had a $3.3 million property. They listed it for sale. This guy buys it for the asking price, which the, the, the uh, Boltz's, it was, uh, what's the guy's name? I, I want to make sure I get, the, uh, Sean Boltz said was $3.1 million. About a week later, the BLM nonprofit bought it for 5.8. Where did that $2.7 million go? Right. It seems like, just seems like, seems like it went to fighting racism that and sexism. A nonprofit you. <laughs> pulled a shady deal mm -hmm. to give $2.7 million to launder it out of a nonprofit into private hands. So it is now obfuscated and used for who knows what. I was waiting for that launder word because that's what it seems does. like. It does seem like it sounds like it's just, <laughs> it's just a hint of, you know, the, I'm going to go all the way on this. First of all, this BLM is a con game all the way down. It is a con game all the way down. They tore this country apart over the death of a fentanyl addict who resisted arrest. And he, he the policing was bad in that story, but they tore the country apart. The police don't kill black people. The police are not prejudiced against black people. Black people commit a, an inordinate amount, let me put it another way, an inordinate amount of the crime, violent crime that is committed, is committed by people who are black. 50% of murders. I think there's a better way to put it. I think it's uh, poor people. And a lot of a lot of black neighborhoods tend to be it, impoverished. Maybe, maybe, but the facts are the facts. If 50% of the country, 7% of the country are black males. It's not that 7% of the country are committing 50% of the murders because it's a small number. The majority of black people, of course, are not murderers at all. It's a small number of bad guys who are black who are committing 50% of the crime. That puts police in a certain position. That means you are statistically more suspicious when you go into a neighborhood and you're black. So you get, and it's very insulting and upsetting for a stand up guy who's black to get stopped by the police for nothing. Right. But it's also upsetting for a stand up cop who's also in the majority to be accused of being uh, racist because there was a bad cop. So so all I'm saying is this is a con game from the beginning. Their open plan in the, on their website until they took it down was a Maoist plan to introduce, uh, violently introduce yep. socialism and destroy the American family and destroy, as they call it, cisgender sexuality. And they did it through riots. It's, a con, it's all and, a con and, game. And specifically on their website, Targeting the family, disrupting the nuclear family. Yes, and, but, and, but yeah. I, I, I would love to actually have a deeper, like a moral discussion because I don't. I, I think we often don't don't go through it. Um, I mentioned poverty, and you mentioned race, but right. I, I don't think you're implying that um, based on race they're committing more crime. Just that I, I don't. I don't imply that. I don't think that's right. true at all. I think the left thinks it's true. I right. think that's why they want to get rid of uh, bail and they want to get rid of policing because they don't. They literally, the left does not think black people can rise above. And I thoroughly believe they can. So the, the, the issue I see, you know, having grown up in Chicago, having lived in New York, is that uh, I agree. I think the stats are the stats that come from right. the FBI. Um, I think it's tied to poverty. And then there's the issue of historical wealth and systemic racism. 
Now, often the right says, you know, there isn't systemic racism, or we recently saw with John Stewart and Andrew Sullivan. Sullivan said, what systems, what systems? John had a terrible argument. I think Andrew performed poorly. Did you see that segment yeah. they did? Yeah. And so, so I, I would love to get your thoughts on this. You know, the way I see it is uh, crime is tied to poverty. And I think what we end up seeing with like FBI crime stats, it actually generates racist beliefs that some people believe race is the component that causes the crime. I think poverty is the component. And I think there are elements of history uh, in the United States going back to, say, the 80s. Uh, see, I would, I would say culture. I, I, if poverty caused crime, uh, Wall Street would be an honest place. What poverty does is it limits the kind of crime you could commit. The guy who holds right. you up in a, an alley would happily write a check and, and you know, steal money from a company without risking his life. Well, then, but then he doesn't it, have that option. Is it That's violent crime? Is it violent crime, yeah. So, but, but people are sinful. They're broken. They're criminal. And, and that is going to come out everywhere. However, the culture, black culture, has been utterly destroyed. And it was destroyed by great society programs by the left. Before the great society, before Lyndon Johnson's great society, black people were moving into the middle class faster than they were afterward. They were warned, the, the Democrats were warned by a Democrat, by their own guy, that these programs would foster uh, single parent homes and destroy the black family. It used to be that 25% of black children were born out of wedlock. Now it's 75%. That's more than when Democrats were actually selling their slaves because all the slave owners were Democrats too. They were s selling their slaves down the river to purposely break up the family. It's worse now. They finally broke up the black family. When you go into a prison, a, a Democrat will tell you, oh, look, they're all black and Hispanic, therefore it must be black. They're all fatherless, every single one. You go down that, that prison cell, you are looking at one fatherless child after another. It's culture. It, and, it, and you people are poor and honest. Most black people who are poor are also honest. You know, they're trying to build uh, jobs. They're trying to build a life and all this. But when you have no father, when you have broken homes, when each guy has three different baby mamas and all this stuff, you are going to have more crime. And that's what's happened. This is this has only happened since the 60s, since the, you know, uh, Jason Riley, the, one of the much better writers about uh, black problems in America, had a book and it was called Please Stop Helping Us. <laughs> you oh, know? Yeah, yeah. And that's what I think the problem is. It makes me wonder about uh, the Democrats' position before civil rights and how their position after civil rights still perpetuates serious problems in the black community. Well, right, because, I mean, the, the Martin Luther King idea that you should be judged by the content of your character, not the color of your skin, has gone out the window. Let me, let, I want to point something out. Uh, you saw in, in California, they were trying to repeal the civil rights provision from their constitution. Do you remember this? Uh, because of the, uh, because of the fact that they kept them from doing affirmative action? Right. Yeah, right. And so I had a conversation with a friend who is woke, and I asked, do you know the demographics of California arts? Yeah, it's overwhelmingly white. I think it's like 70% white. And I said, and do you believe that there are towns in California that are 90, 99% white? Well, yes, of course. Of course there are. Do you think those towns, when this law passes, or when you repeal the civil rights provision, do you think they're now all of a sudden going to have an epiphany and recognize that uh, they should treat everyone equally? Or do you think that those people, because by virtue of being white, they're racist, will be racist towards black people with impunity because you've repealed the protections. No. Huh. Good question. Right. Yeah. I, I, so, but, but, you know, but, but my point there, I, I'm sorry, just is yeah. stop helping people, right? That's the point. They, they, they say, we're going to help you with these, these things, and they take away a provision that was fought long and hard for, civil right. rights. Mm -hmm. well, and and look, at the way, look at the way Democrats, the left, let's say, talk about black people. They say, well, we want more black people in school, so we've, in college, so we've got to lower the standards. And you think, really? How about raising the educational level of your, the crappy schools in their neighborhoods? What would that be like? Or well, giving this, them this, school choice. Oh, so them, they can well, decide where right. to send their kids and, to and Obama just failing gutted schools. that. Yes, the yeah. Democrats continually got that. But this is the problem. You know, when it comes to, we have, a, we have a lot of problems. You know, giving my, I'll give you my perspective from Chicago. Racial segregation is the norm in Chicago, yep. mostly by choice, but still the remnants of blockbusting and redlining. So redlining is when they said, you know, that the real estate companies or whatever, they would draw out areas where they're like, we'll only move certain people of certain races, you know, black people in these areas near the red line. And so you end up with enclaves. There's actually, uh, where I grew up, 47th Street, 47 South. When you cross it to the north, it becomes an entirely black community. To the south, it's fairly mixed, a lot of Polish immigrants. And what happens is the remnants of those uh, policies result in people wanting to move into areas where there's people of their own community. So it keeps segregation fairly entrenched. 
But then you also have laws that were passed that seemingly do the same thing. I've, I've talked about how they had a, a Latino elotes carts, the corn with the mayo and stuff, and they wouldn't let them come to our neighborhood. They passed a, a, a law or whatever banning them from crossing, crossing one street. Just so happens that one street, once you cross it, all the ads are in Spanish. Mm. So I, I think you've got in Chicago a very serious Democrat problem. I personally think that they thrive on racism. I absolutely yes. I agree. They, I totally they, agree. Yeah. They make it worse because they can weaponize it to win elections. Yeah. You end up with Chicago being run by Democrats for what now, 100 years? With with what? how many improvements have, have come? It's only gotten worse. It's only gotten worse. It's yeah. only gotten worse. But you know, what, if, if, if I may just, um, people like to gather with their own. This, this country, we, we forget what a revolutionary experiment this country is. What Andrew Sullivan said to John Stewart was exactly right. I lived out of this country for seven years. This is the least racist country on earth. That doesn't mean it's not racist. That doesn't mean there aren't racists. That doesn't mean there aren't systems in place that can be uh, reformed. But this is the only country in the world f since Rome, since the Roman Empire, where we say, if you come over, you are an American. You come here, you're an American. Doesn't matter what you look like, doesn't matter where you come from. If you look at who is most successful in American, I think in America, I think it's Indian Americans. Certainly Chinese Americans are successful. So it's not color, it's not skin color that's keeping people down. This country is amazing in its ethnic diversity. And when you leave places like L.A. and Chicago that are so largely segregated, like I'm living in a place now where there are plenty of middle class black people, the couples are all mixed and all this stuff. And you think like, yeah, this is what America does. It has always done it. There's a special problem with black people, which is that they, everybody else came here to escape the oppression. They alone were oppressed here, and that is a huge difference. It takes a certain amount of grace to forgive a country for doing that to you. I think they're going to have to exercise that grace because it's the only thing that's going to free them from anger in the past. But it's a tough thing to ask for. I think, I think the solution is simple, and a lot of these woke people don't want to accept it. If we've already passed laws, out, uh, out, we've outlawed blockbusting and redlining and mm -hmm. other racist, right. overtly racist policies, then the solution at this point becomes class-based. If, you, if, if the left believes that the black community is disproportionately affected by historical racism and they're impoverished because of it, lack of generational wealth, then instead of making race in the law, you just say we're going to provide tax benefits, tax credits to certain families at certain levels, which we do, and then you will disproportionately benefit black families or, uh, you, you know. You got to talk about the culture too. The, this is the thing that gets me about conservatives here. This bothers me about conservatives. Conser everybody knows in America, and this is still true to this day, if you get married before you have children, if you go to high school, if you graduate high school and then get married and then have children, you probably won't be poor. That's that's yeah. just the, yeah. the stats. However, however, if you grow up without a dad, if your mom is addicted to drugs, you know, it's a little harder to do that. You know, it's, this is the thing that conservatives forget about. Like, it may be a little tougher. It's, it's easier to do that when you grow up in the suburbs and you've seen it done. You know, white kids listen to rap and hip-hop, which I, I'm sorry, I think is garbage. But white kids listen to it ironically. Black kids listen to it, and it actually affects the way they live and their culture. If we don't— if White we kids don't, like rap, dude. Come on. No, they like it, but they, but they listen to it ironically. They no. don't think, oh, yes, they do, because they, they go home and they see, oh, my, my mom and dad like each other. They're not beating yeah, up hoes. You know, but there's white people in, in, in these neighborhoods. I grew up from the south side I, of Chicago. Everyone I, listened to rap. I understand, but we're talking about— Little white kids listen to Master P. I understand that, but we're talking about— They weren't coming home to good moms. Like, my, my friend's mom was a heroin addict. I, I understand, but— Again, we're talking about generality and statistics, right? We're, ta we're not talking about the, the people who do that. We're saying there is this problem of crime in black communities that it's not in white I communities. I think you're talking about class, actually, because you're talking about South Side Chicago, and it's the same as what you're talking about in the black community. So maybe it's just a, a, it's a community issue. I think the skin color is a false flag, that the consciousness of these people that are like the great-grandchildren of slaves or great-great-grandchildren are still poor and so they're doing crime and then because you see their skin color you're like well it's the black skin color that's well, I, involved. I, I agree with saying, that I mean, saying, I, that's, well, but at the same time you have these left wing I, activists who make it all about the skin color right. and as a result of that they forward policies that actually do end Big up mistake. keeping the group down as a whole I would hang out like I lived in Atlanta it was real multicultural I went to live on Normal Avenue you know with a Mexican community and I would I would think words to people instead of speak because I didn't speak the language and it was I could integrate really nicely and I understand what you're saying that there's a the black community I, I sometimes I push back on this because I want to believe that we're all one community as a, as a species but it's, it's a it's like a lot of hugging cooking home home meal made meals a lot of calling your mom on the phone like that's not in the white it wasn't really part of my community growing up I mean my mom wanted us to have dinner together but it wasn't that like hugging love that I sensed in that community mm-hmm 
Um, so uh, maybe I, I well, can concede that they well, are. Well, you know, a lot of the, a lot of these problems exist. For instance, in what they now call hillbilly communities, and so because it's the same thing, it's the same broken culture, and it's the same poverty, except they're white. So it, it's it's definitely not skin color. It's definitely not about skin color, but it is about cultures that do tend to accrue in groups of people, right? So you know, if I put if I put a, took a hundred people and put them in a space capsule, they would instantly become a new race, right? Because they'd sleep with each other and they would just, their children would be related and whatever happened to them would af- affect them. So it is culture, but th- because people tend to gather together with their kind and sometimes, as you say, are forced to gather together with their kind, those cultures let's, are going to look like a, cer- a certain Let's clarify way. that music point. You're, you're specifically, ref- you're referring to like the gangsta culture music, right. not rap as, as music. No, I, I hate it as music, but but still, but that's my personal opinion. Man, you know, I, see, I don't understand that. I think rap's great. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> ben also he said like rap. It's not music. music, okay, folks. I remember that. It's a huge controversy. I like, I like it's, not, it's not even music. All right, okay. I'm, I'm, don't like, even come at me with that. This is, I, yo, this is like, like I'm, I feel like I'm home. When I walk, when I walk down the street, when I walk down the street with my boombox, I'm playing classical music. Okay, none of that hip hop. Have you heard "Handlebars" by Flowbots? No, and I'm not going to. You are gonna. You're gonna love it. You're absolutely gonna. Yeah, it's 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 basically telling the story of. Uh, someone growing up and then eventually becoming a despot. You know, I, I was in a an Uber, uh, go, going and coming, one direction being driven by a guy, one by a girl. Both ways they were singing, they were playing on the radio the same song, right? The same. Uh, I don't. I don't know if it's hip hop or rap, whatever it was. And the story was about a, a, a woman being forced to perform uh, fellatio, and while they laughed at her, and it was. I just wanted to say, like, you know, this is degrading. It's degrading to listen but to. But that's not indicative of rap. That's indicative of a certain kind of music, Gangster like a certain, rap. a certain, a certain. It's indicative of a certain artist themselves. You know what I mean? But if you have a but like, look at Madonna. Listen, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm on my knees praying or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But if you have a, all I'm saying is, if you're listening to that song and you have a mom and dad who treat each other nicely, that doesn't mean that much. It's ironic. It's kind of, it's like watching. It's like me watching a gangster movie. I love gangster movies. I'm never going to go out and kneecap somebody, you know. But if you are growing up in a in a dysfunctional house or a dysfunctional culture, a dysfunctional neighborhood, and you're listening to that, it may well become your standard for how you treat women. I think you know, from where I grew up. The, the neighborhood I was in was was very like very multiracial and uh-huh. that was a lot of the music everyone listened to. Yeah. So people weren't going home to a mom and dad who were like you know dancing on date night. We, they were going home to broken homes. So how how were the outcomes in that, uh, that neighborhood? I, I mean, I've had a couple of friends of mine who were white die of heroin overdoses. They almost all were in gangs and they were white. They're all still very poor and their lives are. But, some some people have I rest found my middle case. class <laughs> middle class living. Yeah. Oh, definitely cultural issues for sure. Yeah. And that's that's I think we we definitely agree on that one. My my whole thing is just like, rap music is not all you know just talking about beating women and doing awful things and shooting people up. Like there's rap music that's very like thoughtful, thought provoking and modest and Yahoo. Well-made, for this instance, is, this is this good. is the only subject on which I'm probably more conservative than Ben, so I, I probably shouldn't get into this. <laughs> you know, but, but, well, I think but you made you a great f- point about the but, brainwashing power of media. It's uh, massive. Me, me, it's massive, and we're yeah. on a new and a new environment, a new uh, and, horizon. And, and, but, and it interacts with culture because, again, yeah. you know, I can play a violent video game. It's not going to mean a thing to me. But if you're playing it for twelve hours a day and nobody's taking care of you, it actually does. But just 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 to clarify, when you're referring to rap, are you referring to about the content of the songs, what well, they depict? Well, uh, I, I would also I also think the music is is simplistic, but I think rock music is simplistic too. So I'm not the right person to talk to. But oh, I yeah. do think the degraded lyrics are are a problem but so, so that's just an issue of particular artists like i mean there's 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 rock music that's also sim- simplistic trash too you know with bad lyrics i agree <laughs> I, yes, yeah. no, I haven't liked the song since like 1500 you know when it comes to hip-hop i, wanna, I, wanna, I, wanna I like play, melody well, it's melody vocal melody that's what i'm missing with yeah. hip-hop why yeah. don't ever get into it really you know i i have to tell you this is absolutely my father was a, a fairly famous new york dj and he played what was called then middle of the road music which is now called the american songbook so as a little kid i grew up listening to frank sinatra and cole porter gershwin and all this stuff one day my father who knew music really well came home and said this new thing has come out it's amazing this band out of britain called the beatles and he played it for me and i was like what eight years old you know wow. and i and i said are you kidding me she loves you yeah yeah you're gonna trade cole porter for that and he said no no this is the new thing <laughs> I'm talking to like a 50 year old yeah. man, you know. So I, I just stayed where I was. I went through the entire 60s listening to Sinatra. <laughs> so. I gotta, I gotta tell you, I agree. Um, I listen to music on the radio sometimes, like well now it's streaming services, yeah. autoplay, and I'm just like, this song has no meaning behind it at all. Right. It's just, but you know, take a look at um, Nirvana, "Smells Like Teen, uh, Teen Spirit." This 
song is mostly gibberish. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. I find a lot of rock. I found even a lot of, I mean, I, I actually kind of like the Beatles, but I found a lot of their songs incomprehensible. I've got two songs to Have show you. Have you taken LSD? That'll help. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm I've, got, sure. I've got two songs for you. We'll, we'll, we'll show you. Um, one's rap, one's not. We'll show you after the show. All right, all right. You know, but, uh, and but, it is mandatory. You will hold <laughs> you down. Kind of get, you know, no, I'm sorry. I can't and you myself. have to watch Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we already did that to Michael Malice. He is absolutely required. <laughs> I um, love Star Trek. Michael no, Malice didn't like Star Trek. Sometimes in hip-hop, you get like when they're talking like this, you hear like the melody and the tone. You can kind of derive a melody out of that. Like the voice goes up and down when they're making their sound. And you're like, oh. Do you I like uh, singing? Do you like Charlie Daniels band? Yeah. Devil went down to Georgia. Yeah. Oh yeah. Best songs song. ever. I love that song. Yeah. I saw a funny tweet. It said, "When I was little, I thought that the Devil and his Demon band sounded better than you know Johnny, and I felt bad about it." <laughs> and I'm like, "But anyone who objectively listens it's to Catholic that song guilt, knows that the Demon band." section of the song does sound that way was, better. The that bass line. The, the, the person who started the Salvation Army, that's what he said. Why should the devil get all the best tunes? That was mm. one of the great lines. That song's so good. <laughs> I love that song. Devil went down to Georgia. I mean, I love the future. I'm a joke where it's like, wouldn't a solid, solid gold fiddle weigh... <laughs> You know, be, uh, be heavy and sound crummy <laughs> and yeah, sound lousy. Yeah. <laughs> let's 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 talk about this story too because well, we, we. I, I want to mention one thing really quickly about this story because we strayed from it a bit, but I just wanted to make a quick point. Uh, I think it is poetically beautiful that the house was purchased from televangelists because yes. BLM they are the <laughs> yes. exact same thing. It is a modern iteration. They're the holy people who everyone knows are grifters and hacks, and every normal person rolls their eyes at, but for some reason have esteem and legitimacy because they claim to be fighting for a good cause. Thanks for checking out this segment from the TimCast IRL podcast. But if you want to check out the full show live, tune in Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And if you want more special access content, head over to TimCast.com and become a member. Your membership helps sustain this company, keep our journalists employed, makes this show happen, and you will get access to exclusive members-only segments of the TimCast IRL podcast. And there's a massive library to check out. So again, go to TimCast.com or tune in Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And we'll see you all there.